Greetings. This is September 10th at 9 p.m. and I believe we're beginning a new path on the Elephant Hill wildfire into assessment and recovery. In a quick look at the VIIRS infrared for the area, uh, I'm seeing no new hot spots and neither the northern flank or the southern flank. We are looking at the northern flank right now with Green Lake on the left hand side of your screen, Sheridan in the top right, and Egan at the right hand portion of your screen to the east. A quick sample of the time on one of these outside perim perimeter hotspots was at uh, September 7th, approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And a quick look of the BC wildfire bulletins, and the link is below. Uh, indicates that they will be doing some reduction of fuel, some hand ignitions, and generally assessing the areas and making sure that uh, there's no more flare-ups. We are seeing these remaining indications of smoldering heat that's still in the area. We were looking at the area around Loon Lake, Hyheum, and now we're looking at Young Lake. And again, these indications may be off their position slightly, and they may be obscured by some atmosphere hanging around, but generally it was a fairly nice day. There is a breeze rolling in from the southwest, 14 kilometers an hour, and this will vary depending on whether you're in valleys or you're up on the plateau. It seems to be a little quicker on the plateaus today. We may be looking at a wind event tomorrow, uh, starting around noon, going to about 20 kilometers an hour at 3 o'clock, and there could be gusts up to 50 kilometers an hour coming from the south. So we want to watch areas that are smoldering, and just in case uh, it dries everything out rapidly. However, the wind that we're having tomorrow is kind of a precursor to another squall, some more rain, so uh, moisture precipitation is on the way. As the urgency of the wildfire begins to subside, I think we can start looking at what recovery efforts and what assessment of the forest situation is going to be. Um, I'm sure there are going to be plenty of discussions going into the winter months and prior to next fire season the territory that uh, has been lost to fires and uh, what effect that's going to have on soil erosion, is there some concerns about flooding, and uh, what can be done to ensure that we have a healthy forest in the future. One of the ways to start is to look at the data that we have and uh, the satellite imagery showing burn areas, showing forested areas and riparian sections that have survived and examining what has made uh, a healthy forest and what sections may have succumbed and turned into these catastrophic wildfires because of the accumulation of fuel over the years. Uh, some sections of the forest are quite choked uh, with uh, competing stands of trees, uh, fewer nutrients, and we have to look at, at what we can do to make the forest a, a safer place and a healthier place. So I'd like to take you on a quick little overhead tour of where I abide, and this is kind of my place in the forest, and if we zoom out we can see kind of my neighborhood, and if we zoom further out you can see where I may have some concerns about uh, the condition of the forest and the health of the forest. So let's zoom in and I'll show you what it looks like on the ground. About 90% standing is lodgepole pine and about 40% of that is dead. It's just standing there. It hasn't been blown over by the wind and it's uh, an opportunity for fires to ladder up and get into the crowns of trees. Some have fallen over and I've found what looks like stacks of wood and they're actually just groves of pine that have wind blown and they are just lying there as slash on the ground. Another aspect is the lack of diversity. 
yes, there are some sprigs of cedar coming up. There's actually a few cedar trees in there. Um, there's some fir interdispersed, and there are on the outer edges some aspen and other deciduous. However, within the forest, there's not a lot of healthy ground cover. There's not a lot of vegetation for the wildlife to eat. It's been starved out, and the the canopy of the the pine is so thick in some areas, both with the dead wood and the living trying to compete for sunlight, that not a lot grows on the forest floor. And at first appearance, it doesn't seem very healthy. So one of the first things I started doing was pulling down the dead wood and uh, bucking it up, getting it out of the way, and then limbing uh, some of the trees so that this could get cleaned out. Uh, this, what emerged were some paths and trails that had probably been there since the 1800s. Um, continuing on, just kept on uh, pulling out more wood. And after a couple of seasons, wildlife became very curious and the grass started sprouting up. And I've noticed that uh, there's a definite greening in the forest area. There's more space for uh, vegetation to get sunlight in. There's more diversity now in, in some of the natural foliage. We're looking at an image uh, up onto a rise. It's uh, approaching sunset, and you can actually see the sunset through the trees on the ground level. So what we're doing here is probably the most important step we can take to fire prevention. If a wildfire does come through, it's going to be confined to the grass and move below the trees, doing its natural activity without leaping up into the forest, candling and crowning out and spreading in a catastrophic manner. And as you can see, there's uh, no small task ahead. It's a process and it's taking years to slowly bring health back into the forest. And Looking around what's available on YouTube, there is a general consensus that uh, we're on the right track. We're considering what individual species need, uh, the spacing between trees, biodiversity, encouraging a mix of both deciduous cedar, fir, pine, and looking at what's on the ground cover, the natural grasses that uh, are going to provide nutrition for the wildlife in all seasons, and especially in the wintertime when they're uh, looking for these pockets of natural vegetation to uh, meet whatever requirements they need when there's a lot of snow cover. Another aspect that we've come to accept is that fire is a natural component and necessary to the health of uh, this forest. In fact, many conifers require the heat from a fire to open up their cones and release the seeds in order to reproduce. Looking at a cross section here on a video, and I'll put the link, uh, every 10 years or so, there is a natural forest fire that goes through, most likely due to a lightning strike, and this has promoted healthy growth in old trees. However, early on in the last century, uh, there was extensive priority put on suppressing natural fire. And this caused an actually a detriment in the health of the tree as uh, it began to compete for canopy space from other trees and the density became so much that nutrients were stripped from the soil. So this is the situation I find myself in in the surrounding forest. Yes, nothing has burned here in a long time. However, the nothing is growing very well either. So it's a, going to be a labor-intensive process in order to do it without using uh, controlled or prescribed burns in order to do what naturally would occur with lightning strikes. So without a fire in recent years, the forest next to me is no longer a happy place for a tree to grow. Uh, there's not a lot of wildlife in there and it's hazardous to walk through because of all the hanging deadwood and the, 
the footfalls and traps from logs crisscrossing every which way. However, a prescribed or controlled burn is not going to work in this forest because of its current condition. It would easily crown and become catastrophic and go beyond any guards and would approach upon built up areas and other communities. It's, it's gone too far to control it with uh, regular burns and uh, fire keeping methods. So we find ourselves in a situation where each year we're spending more and more money to suppress fires that are becoming more and more volatile and in essence we are protecting now a tinderbox. And we have to be on guard, we have to be on watch because our communities and our neighborhoods are interdispersed and interfaced with the forested areas. That's why I'm working to bring back the forest to its natural state with extensive spacing between the trees, lots of natural vegetation, biodiversity, so that when a forest fire does go through, it's actually providing a benefit to the area surrounding me. So if there's something that I've learned in watching the data that's come in surrounding the Elephant Hill wildfire, that is to check with multiple sources, to gain as much information as possible. And going forward and assessing uh, what vision we have for the forest and what we're going to do to prevent forest fires in the future and catastrophic wildfires, we have to look at all sides and see whether forest fires are helpful whether our community interfaces uh, can be reorganized and whether or not uh, types of forest management that include uh, thinning and biodiversity can be incorporated to make an overall healthy part of the planet that we live in. It doesn't matter to me if this was human caused or if it was naturally caused. The conditions were still the same. Uh, the, the forest was overdue and credit must go to our wildfire fighters and the people that came from all parts of the world to help out because this was not a, a natural fire that could easily run out and uh, die down on its own. This was a condition that had been built up for several years, many years, decades, and complicated by the mountain pine beetle disease and just an overall densification. So as we enter the assessment phase, the recovery phase of the Elephant Hill wildfire, I want to thank you for coming along on this journey. I will be back. I'll post some updates and maybe some recommendations on uh, how we can amalgamate data. And I just want to start you thinking about the forest and the condition it's in and what we can do to make it cleaner, greener, and healthier for the wildlife that live there. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your comments. And I'll be back as soon as I have new information. Keep your nose to the breeze. Brent, get out of there. I know what I'm doing. <laughs>